And so I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from the Scopes trial. So when people tell us, I, I often hear secular scientists say, creation evolution, ah, that issue was resolved at the Scopes trial. Wait a minute, wait a minute, do you realize most of the evidence for evolution back then, today, is no longer accepted by, by evolutionists at all? Uh, no, we need to learn the lesson of the Scopes trial. This is patently absurd. Very little has been overturned. Instead, we have a much better understanding of the process of evolution. So it would be a gross exaggeration, at best to state, or even imply, that evolution is a scientific fact. That concludes Ms. Folger's strawman and dishonesty riddled semantics argument. Now allow us to present the reality of the issue. The fact of evolution is the verifiable observation that the ratios of alleles present in populations change from generation to generation. This observation has been made countless times. The theory of evolution is the grand unifying principle of modern biology, based on the explanation of the fact of evolution. It makes many predictions, such as common descent, natural selection, sexual selection, genetic drift, adaptation, speciation, extinction, etc. The theory of evolution can be used to develop a model of evolution, which can then be applied to new observations to test hypotheses. One such example is the general time reversible model of nucleotide sequence evolution. This is the formula for calculating the log likelihood of the evolution occurring at a single site in a nucleotide sequence. It's, it's a good thing we have computers now. Let me show you how the myths about evolution having been proven are created. Almost all science textbooks include England's peppered moth as the classic example of evolution by natural selection. The theory says that dark and light colored moths rested on tree trunks during the day and birds ate them. The hypothesis actually stated that birds preferentially preyed on the two different color morphs depending on the environmental conditions. But on trees covered with a whitish colored fungus. No, it's a lichen. The light moths were able to survive because they were camouflaged. When the Industrial Revolution hit, pollution and dark soot reversed the effects. No, it changed the selective pressure. There was a scientific hypothesis that in periods where the trees of a forest were darkened by industrial smoke, moths which were dark in color would be better able to survive because the birds wouldn't be able to see them and um, light colored moths would be eaten more often and so for a time you would get more dark moths and fewer light moths in a population. In other words, evolution was happening. Scientists who believed in the myth of evolution gloated over this. That was another ad hominem attack. Saying the results proved that evolution by natural selection is true. Frankly, the observational evidence was extremely compelling. The problem is, peppered moths don't rest on tree trunks during the day. That was another outright lie. 50.4% of peppered moths rest at the junction of branches in the trunk. 37% rest directly on the trunk. After more than 40 years of intense field study, only two peppered moths have ever been seen naturally resting on tree trunks. That is another lie. It seems this clear case of Darwinian evolution by natural selection is just one more example of wishful thinking and scientific blunders. That was an appeal to ridicule based on the previous lies. So where did all the evolution textbook get pictures of peppered moths on different colored tree trunks? You'll probably be amazed to discover just how far this media spin was taken by scientists who wanted to believe their own story. They were all staged. Yes, our esteemed creationists seem to believe that insects regularly pose for photographs while being preyed on by birds. The moths were glued, pinned, placed into tree trunks, and their pictures taken. The scientists who used the pictures in their books to prove evolution all conveniently forgot to tell their readers that little subtle fact. All right, it is time to end this rather pathetic hatchet job on Dr. Bernard Kettlewell. Here's the actual story of the research on the peppered moth. The peppered moth has two distinct color morphs controlled by a single locus. There's the light morph and the dark. Dr. Bernard Kettlewell began studying peppered moths in 1952. 
His initial observation was that the dark morph dominated in industrial areas, while the light morph dominated rural areas. This observation was not horribly shocking as it had been made prior to Darwin's publication of On the Origin. Yes, in spite of what creationists claim, intensive study on the peppered moth began shortly after discovery of the first dark morph in 1811. In 1896, J.W. Tutt hypothesized that the change was due to selective predation by birds. He carried out small, simple predation experiments that supported his hypothesis. By 1895, dark morphs represented 98% of the population in Manchester, England. In 1948, they represented only about 2% of the population. It was also deduced that the coloration was controlled by the spread of a single allele. Over a hundred years after intensive study began on the peppered moth, Bernard Kettlewell finally takes the stage in this drama, or rather, melodrama. Kettlewell's first experiments involved controlled release of a mixed group of peppered moths into an aviary. Kettlewell recorded the proportion of survivors at various time intervals. Again, the evidence supported bird predation based on color morph. In 1953, Kettlewell conducted mark, release, and recapture experiments in a polluted woodland. Again, bird predation based on color morph was the supported conclusion, and we have to thank those poor unfortunate grad students who had to run through the woods in the middle of the night catching moths for that. In 1955, Kettlewell repeated the experiment using an unpolluted woodland. Again, the same conclusion was reached, and again, the grad students suffered for you. So, what about Miss Folger's accusation? Those were Kettlewell's controlled predation experiments to confirm his previous findings while eliminating as many variables as possible. Because insects are rather uncooperative in arranging themselves into a scientific prey preference experiment, Dr. Kettlewell eliminated as many uncontrolled variables as possible, which is a hallmark of scientific methodology. By placing the different color morphs, on trees. Dr. Kettlewell was never deceptive about the conditions of his experiments. Dr. Michael Majerus has continued Kettlewell's work. Majerus's studies have determined the natural resting places of peppered moths, as well as confirmed predation by birds as the primary selective pressure. Majerus was also able to further show that the lichen of the trees camouflaged light morphs in both the visible as well as the ultraviolet spectrum. Dark morphs were likewise camouflaged in both spectrums, except that they absorb UV light rather than reflect it, much like the bark of a bare tree. Oh, and for the record, birds are capable of seeing in both the visible spectrum as well as the ultraviolet. Following environmental cleanup in the 1960s, the proportion of dark morphs has been steadily decreasing. It appears that Ms. Folder's knowledge of this topic both begins and ends with Dr. Kettlewell's controlled experiment. Rather than examine all of the evidence, she has misguidedly attacked one small aspect of an immense body of research. If the best example of evolution that has ever been documented has been used as proof by eminent evolutionary biologists for more than 40 years is not true. As Ms. Folger has demonstrated, attacking a straw man is rather easy. Ms. Folger then selectively interprets various passages from the Bible and claims that they represent valid science. We cut that nonsense to spare you from it, except for one tidbit. We know that when Columbus made his trip to discover India and they landed here in America, that uh, when he took off, uh, there was tremendous fears that he would come to the edge of the earth and would plunge off into nothing. That was complete and utter nonsense. Europeans fully understood that the earth was spheroid in shape. The contention was the distance that Columbus would need to travel before reaching Asia. The crack researchers at ICR are relying on Washington Irving's biography of Christopher Columbus. Irving incorporated as much factual material into the biography as he did in his more well-known work, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. 